Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bhanu Priya Rohila from Mohanlal Sukharia University and today in this lecture we are going to discuss William Wordsworth's preface to lyrical ballads. The video is being recorded for the third phase of DTH Swayam Prabha program run by MHRD New Delhi. The lecture is a part of the fifth unit of the paper British Romantic Literature run by Utkal University for the students of semester 3 of BA English Honours. The syllabus is based on the UGC CBCS syllabus of the same paper. In the fifth unit of the syllabus, you have two pieces of criticism and the first one is Preface to the Lyrical Ballads by William Wordsworth. We have discussed in the first unit already that the book Lyrical Ballads was considered as the formal beginning of the Romantic era. Lyrical Ballads is a poetry collection jointly written by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. It was first published in the year 1798, in which there were 23 poems in total, out of which 19 were written by Wordsworth and only 4 were by Coleridge. However, the preface was not a part of it. The second edition came out in 1800 with more poems added to it and with the preface by William Wordsworth. And the preface was further expanded in the next edition that came out in the year 1802. The preface was basically Wordsworth's philosophy behind writing such poems. Later on in the year 1805, he made several changes to it and an appendix was added to it and eventually in 1815 the preface was revised again and an essay supplementary to the preface was also added to it. Initially the preface was to be written by Coleridge. Somehow it was Wordsworth who wrote it although he was a poet originally and not a critic, neither by training nor by temperament. But still, he came up with this long essay, which is now regarded as a landmark in the history of English criticism. When the preface came out, Coleridge had certain disagreements with it. And therefore, to express his own ideas, he wrote Biographia Literaria. Now the question is what was so different about the poems in this book? The book was written as an experiment by them and in the first edition there was only an advertisement instead of a preface. Later Wordsworth felt the need of a preface or a detailed introduction at least. So he wrote it and now it has come to be seen as the manifesto of romanticism and it is a 
break away from the neoclassical literature. It is to be noted here that Wordsworth did not propound any movement or his preface was not the laid down uh, rules for writing romantic poetry, but these are just his own ideas about how to write poetry, which, which inspired a whole generation of poets and writers who produced a corpus which later came to be known as romantic literature. Now, what was so different in this preface that it became a groundbreaking work? So, you all are aware that romantic period in literature started as a reaction against the neoclassical age in literature and also it started amidst the two greatest revolutions of the time that is industrial revolution and French revolution. Wordsworth, who was a great supporter of the French Revolution initially, soon got disillusioned by it and he had to leave France. All this left him disheartened and on the other hand, growing industrialization had started its adverse impact on the society. And the urban spaces, despite their sophistication and modernity, were full of hunger, anxiety, poverty and sorrow. Industries and the poor working conditions were taking away peace and joy from people. Afar from all this, the Romantics found peace in nature and rustic life. And as we have discussed it in the first unit that Wordsworth, who is also known as Pantheist, was the greatest nature poet of the time. Not that he was the first nature writer. Blake and Thompson had already uh, paved the path for such poetry. But the way Wordsworth treated nature, that is as a divine power and as a healer, this was unprecedented. So he chose rivers, flowers, mountains, rustic places, farmed fields, green meadows and the peasants as the subject matter for his poetry. After returning from France, he was living with his sister Dorothy and in 1795 he met Coleridge. They soon realized that both had a similar temperament and their ideologies too matched to some extent. So, soon their friendship turned into this collection of poetry, which is now a, a prominent work, not just of 19th century British literature, but, but, but of British literature in total. The preface to Lyrical Ballads was an attempt to exhibit what inspired Wordsworth's writings. To simplify, we can say that the preface mainly deals with four major points. What should be the content of poetry? What should be the language or diction of poetry? What are the characteristics of a poet? And what poetry is? These points we'll discuss now in detail. Now let's discuss what Wordsworth wrote in this preface to Lyrical Ballads. The points of discussion will comprise of the following. Here I have added one more point but uh, that is just to simplify the preface. It goes as, first is his aim and purpose of writing this preface. Second is the subject matter of poetry. Third is language and poetic diction. Fourth is poetry and fifth is his idea about poet. The preface will be followed by a short discussion over the limitations or the shortcomings of Wordsworth's philosophy and thereby making a critical appreciation of the same.
so here we discuss his aim and purpose of writing the preface in the beginning of the preface wordsworth says that the book in 1798 was written as an experiment and he wanted to assess the reception of the new kind of poetry which is written in the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation so as compared to the neo classical era it was certainly new and different kind of poetry in theme style and language so it can be said that he rather wrote this preface in his defense so that he can create a taste in the readers for this kind of poetry which is written in the real language of men in state of emotional excitement he believes that he does not want to reason with the readers for liking his poems and since it is not a systematic defense so this preface would not adequately defend his theory of poetry but he trusts the good sense of his readers so he leaves it on them he wants the readers that these are radically different poems from the conventional ones which they are accustomed to and as an author he is free to use certain techniques and styles because every age witnesses that new ideas and styles by writers of the time keep coming and wordsworth also has written these poems keeping in mind the need of a new kind of poetry to match with the time therefore these poems would not give the readers the same conventional pleasure but this preface is an explanation to why he writes the way he does so that his works are not mistaken as his laziness but it is rather his own style of composition now let's discuss what he says about the subject matter of poetry so we see that wordsworth discusses in his preface about the theme or the content or the subject matter of the poetry he says the principal object then which i proposed to myself in these poems was to choose incidents and situations from common life and to relate or describe them throughout as far as was possible in a selection of language really used by men and at the same time to throw over them a, a certain coloring of imagination whereby ordinary things should be presented to the mind in an unusual way and further and above all to make these incidents and situations interesting by tracing in them truly though not ostentatiously the primary laws of our nature chiefly as far as regards the manner in which we associate ideas in a state of excitement so here wordsworth talks about the main idea while writing these kind of poetry so we see the four key phrases are there first is to choose incidents and situations from common life second is to describe them in a selection of language really used by men third is to throw over them a certain coloring of imagination and the fourth is tracing the ideas in a state of excitement so these four phrases can be seen as the ground for his preface on which he has set up this experiment now he further says low and rustic life was generally chosen and why he chose that because in that condition 
the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity are less under restraint and speak a plainer and more emphatic language because in that condition of life our elementary feelings coexist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may be more accurately contemplated and more forcibly communicated because the manners of rural life germinate from those elementary feelings and from the necessary character of rural okay occupations are more easily comprehended and are more durable and lastly because in that condition the passions of men are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature so this is a very long paragraph but uh, to put in simple words that he chose low and rustic life why he chose because a that gives your heart a conducive environment where essential passions of your feelings can attain maturity and they can be expressed freely and easily second reason was because rustic life is simple and therefore it can express the elementary feelings more accurately and forcefully third reason he felt was that because the manners of rustic life are less sophisticated so they are simple and the understanding of human nature is easier in them and the fourth was because in the rustic condition the human passions are connected with the forms of nature unlike the urban spaces where human passions and feelings are less connected with nature we can say that wordsworth has given too much thrust on the simplicity both of content and style of poetry right now let's discuss the third point that is language and poetic diction as we have discussed already that wordsworth wrote his poetry using real language of men so he has emphasized a lot on his selection of language and according to him it should be closer to the language spoken by common or ordinary people so just like the theme and the content of the poetry language also he chose that of humble and rustic life or people he says the language too of these men is adopted purified indeed from what appear to be its real defects from all lasting and rational causes of dislike or disgust because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived and because from their rank in society and the sameness and narrow circle of their intercourse being less under the influence of social vanity they convey their feelings and notions in simple and unelaborated expressions so here he says that the peasantry communicates very constantly with the best objects and what are the best objects according to him nature from where according to wordsworth best language originates which means their constant closeness to nature makes their language more appealing to him and since the peasantry has a limited circle for communication which is similar to theirs they are less sophisticated than urban or scholarly people and thereby they are less influenced 
by social vanity. So they express their feelings and ideas in very simple words and in very simple language. He further says, accordingly, such a language arising out of repeated experience and regular feelings is a more permanent and a far more philosophical language than that which is frequently substituted for it by poets who think that they are conferring honor upon themselves and their art in proportion as they separate themselves from the sympathies of men and indulge in arbitrary and capricious habits of expression in order to furnish food for fickle tastes and fickle appetites of their own creation. So again, to put it in simple words, he further calls the rustic language a more permanent thing as they are of regular or universal feelings. And he just does not call it permanent, but he also calls it philosophical in comparison to the lofty language of poets who indulge themselves in strange habits of expression. So what are these strange habits of expressions? That is, they are not sincere in their expression. Rather, they keep changing their style and manner of expression. Why? They change their expression as per the fickle or inconsistent or the ever-changing fashion and taste of the readers. So according to Wordsworth, the poets using the language scholastically don't write to express real human emotions, but they just write to suit to the popular taste or style. Now, to understand why he said so, we need to look at the neoclassical poetry. So, neoclassical poetry or the mid 19th century poetry. That poetry used language as Milton and Dryden used. Their poetry or their language was embellished, embellished with high-end vocabulary. Writers like Alexander Pope, Goldsmith and Milton, they are perfect examples of such poetry, which was full of formal language and metrical symmetry. The neoclassical era was imitating the classical writers and their rules and techniques of writing poetry. So, they started using those rules related to content and meter very rigidly, which, which restrained them and curbed their creative expressions and their free uh, expression of creativity, which consequently made their writings look artificial and mechanical. However, Wordsworth believed that meter, which was essential earlier, is not essential for poetry. It is desirable and it can add pleasure to it. He also added that there cannot be any difference between the language of poetry and prose. And the only difference that lies between the two is that of meter. Apart from this, no other difference can be there. And prose and poetry are similar in their nature and functions. So, to validate this, he says, If in a poem there should be found a series of lines or even a single line in which the language, though naturally arranged and according to the strict laws of meter, does not differ from that of prose. There is a numerous class of critics who, when they stumble upon these prosaism, as they call them, imagine that 
they have made a notable discovery and exult over the poet as over a man ignorant of his own profession now these men would establish a canon of criticism which the reader will conclude he must utterly reject if he wishes to be pleased with these volumes so here defending his writing he says that if the language in a poem or in a line is naturally arranged even with the strict meters that is also not different from a prose line in different words a prose is if a prose is written in a good way it is no less than poetry and that some of the most interesting parts of the best poems will be found to be strictly the language of prose when prose is well written he supports his idea by using the name of poets like milton and gray who followed the metrical rules of poetry very rigidly that even in their poems the best lines are similar or closer to prose wordsworth here uses the term prosaism for this tendency of the poets to use prosaic expression in poetry that is prose like expressions in poetry and says that in this collection of poetry in this book the readers would also reject this canon of separation of languages of prose and poetry and would conclude the same if they are pleased with these poems further wordsworth talks about the use of poetic devices and some of these he finds artificial and cliched he says the reader will find that personification of abstract ideas rarely occur in these volumes and i hope are utterly rejected as an ordinary device to elevate the style and raise it above prose i have proposed to myself to imitate and as far as is possible to adopt the very language of men and assuredly such personifications do not make any natural or regular part of that language so here he confirms that he also avoids personification since in order to make the language look real it is important to avoid abstract ideas so that he can keep his reader in the company of flesh and blood that is so that he can use the real language or realistic language in his compositions we are discussing here poetic diction but wordsworth also avoids poetic diction so as to keep the language in his poetry as simple and as honest as possible here he uses a phrase good sense so this good sense is what makes poetry pleasurable this avoidance of such poetic diction prevents him from using from phrases and figures of speech that are considered to be the common inheritance of poets but it also prevents him from using phrases that have lost their meaning and beauty why they have lost their meaning and beauty because they have been overused by not very good poets so he tries to avoid such vocabulary and such words and phrases here we have a passage from his appendix on poetic diction in which he has tried to elaborate the same idea in better words since it is a long passage so we will break it in short pieces so here uh, it goes as 
It is indeed true that the language of the earliest poets was felt to differ materially from ordinary language because it was the language of extraordinary occasions. But it was really spoken by men, language which the poet himself had uttered when he had been affected by the events which he described or which he had heard uttered by those around him. To this language, it is probable that meter of some sort or other was early super added. So here talking about the early poets, Wordsworth says that the early poets believed that the language of poetry should be different from the ordinary language because their poems would talk about the extraordinary or grand events or situations. And therefore, later, meter must have been added to, to their language, to, to their poetry or their poems. But this separation of language, of poetry from ordinary or common one, gave people the experiences that they were not accustomed to, since they never spoke in that language. So this was unusual for them, this was different. This was the great temptation for all the corruption which have followed. Under the protection of this feeling, succeeding poets constructed a phraseology which had one thing. It is true in common with the genuine language of poetry that it was not heard in ordinary conversation, that it was unusual. So Wordsworth calls it a sort of corruption what followed that. So this temptation of writing about grand events and situations in different language made the succeeding writers create new phraseology that is new words, phrases, figures of speech and all which are not heard in ordinary language or in the conversation. So the way we converse is different. But the first poets, which, uh, so the first poets spoke a language which, though unusual, was still the language of men. This circumstance, however, was disregarded by their successors. They found that they could please by easier means. They became proud of a language which they themselves had invented and which was uttered only by themselves and with the spirit of a fraternity. They arrogated it to themselves as their own. So here Wordsworth still does not blame the early writers for what they did. But he blames the successors who became proud of their unusual language that they themselves had created, that the lofty scholastic language that they created and they used it very profusely in their own circle, in their own fraternity. And in the process of, in the process of time, a meter became a symbol or promise of this unusual language and whoever took upon him to write in meter according as be possessed more or less of true poetic genius, introduced less or more of this adulterated phraseology into his compositions. And the true and the false became so inseparably interwoven that, that the taste of men was gradually perverted and this language was received as a natural language. And at length, by the influence of books upon men, did to a certain degree really become so. So here he further argues that gradually the use of meter became the test of true poetic genius. That is, if you use meter in your poetry or in your poetic compositions, you are a genius writer. And if not, then you don't have a good poetic skill. So this trend made the meter inseparable from 
द टेस्ट ऑफ मेन एंड दिस स्टार्टेड टू बी टेकन एज नेचुरल लैंग्वेज एंड बुक्स विच आर ऑल्सो रिटर्न बाय सच सक्सेसर्स हु इन्वेंटेड देयर फ्रेजोलॉजी सो द बुक्स ऑल्सो इन्फ्लुएंस्ड मेन इन टू राइटिंग मोर सच लैंग्वेज विच वॉज एडल्टरेटेड विच वॉज नॉट प्योर in short he tries to say that meter was not a part of the poetic language since the beginning but later poets made it so and they started taking pride in using the corrupt language full of phrases and words invented by themselves and thus meter became the test of anybody's poetic genius according to wordsworth it has perverted the taste of men and adulterated or polluted the language and the poets should use real language and avoid any phraseology or poetic diction so thus he claims that poets use artificial language by adding unnecessary meters and devices or the figurative expressions and such language and poetic creations are not organic so now proceeding uh, towards the fourth point that is poetry so what wordsworth talks or says about poetry goes as we have read that according to wordsworth there is no difference of language between prose and poetry and also that meter and rhyme also cannot make any difference in both then what is poetry according to wordsworth and why he chose to write poetry only so according to wordsworth poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings it takes its origin from emotions recollected in tranquility so poetry is spontaneous overflow of strong feelings but at the same time contradictorily he says poetry originates from emotions recollected in tranquility so spontaneity of feelings and recollections of emotions in tranquility both are a part of the process of creation of poetry according to wordsworth though some critics have criticized him for this contradictory statement however it has been seen as a poetic process of his writing that takes place with observation recollection contemplation and imaginative excitement this is to say that what the poet observes is recollected by him when he is in peace or in in tranquility there he contemplates over the observed and recollected things and then using his imaginative faculty he creates poetry it originates from and is sustained by a genuine and sincere personal feeling and paradoxically in this lies its universal appeal further citing aristotle in his preface wordsworth says poetry is the most philosophic of all writing it is so its object is truth not individual and local but general and operative not standing upon external testimony but carried alive into the heart by passion truth which is its own testimony which gives strength and divinity to the tribunal to which it appeals and receives them from the same tribunal poetry is the image of man and nature which means for wordsworth poetry is philosophical and its object is truth which is universal and general and it requires no other testimonies but this truth is carried in heart by passion 
This last line signifies the, that poetry is the image of man and nature. So it reminds us of Wordsworth's repeated emphasis that man and nature go in tandem and poetry is an image of that. This idea is further backed by him in the following words. Poetry is the breadth and finer spirit of all knowledge. It is the impassioned expression which is in the countenance of all science. Poetry is the first and last of all knowledge. It is as immortal as the heart of man. So here he tries to make a comparison between poetry and science and says that both are in the pursuit of truth and knowledge. But for him, poetry is superior than all sciences since poetry is an impassioned expression. Though he does not assume science as its enemy, but, but he considers them complementary to, to each other. Now, Wordsworth has also discussed in the preface about his idea of a poet. So, what is a poet? He is a man speaking to men. A man endowed with more lively sensibility, more enthusiasm and tenderness who has a greater knowledge of human nature and a more comprehensive soul than are supposed to be common among mankind. So to the question, who is a poet? He answers that he is a man speaking to men, which means the common men. So not merely to express himself, but he writes poetry to converse with others. According to Wordsworth, a poet is gifted with more lively sensibility so that he can penetrate the heart of things. He is with more enthusiasm and compassion. He understands the human nature more exhaustively and he has a more comprehensive soul. That means that he is more affectionate and sympathetic to others than other common people. He also says, poets do not write for poets alone, but for men. A poet must express himself as other men express themselves. So thus, here Wordsworth talks about the so social function of poetry. And he says, to give pleasure is the primary function of poetry. And here the poet thinks of not only of his own pleasures, but also of giving pleasures to other men. Also, a poet must express himself as others express themselves. That is, in simple words, without, uh, without any lofty language and about simple events and situations which are closer to the real life unlike the poets who use scholastic language to which the simple men cannot uh, relate themselves with. Simple men, uh, you know, about they do not understand, they do not identify the situations because the situations are so grand that the common people find no relevance with those with those situations in their own lives. Adding to it, he says, the poet is chiefly distinguished from other men by a greater promptness to think and feel and a greater power in expressing such thoughts which are connected with our moral sentiments and animal sensations. So besides the characteristics he mentioned earlier, he now differentiates poets from common men and says that poets are very quick in thinking and feeling and, it, and also expressing the thoughts and passions, especially the ones which guide our moral sentiments. And he also calls the poets 
upholders and preservers and says that the poets bind together by passion and knowledge the vast empire of human society as it is spread over the whole earth and over all time so here he reiterates that the poets represent the human nature and across the globe irrespective of their class culture and customs poets bind the human society the whole world with passion and knowledge so this was all about the points that we discussed uh, earlier now let's proceed to us the limitations of wordsworth's preface to lyrical ballads as has been discussed already that wordsworth was not a critic by nature and this being his only piece of critical writing it has been criticized by some scholars who have highlighted the faults or flaws of his theories and among such writers or such critics coleridge tops the list and later writers like t s eliot and derrick and several others also have made their critical remarks on him on his preface he made coleridge he made direct observations and comments on wordsworth's theories wordsworth's ideas of poetry and diction have been criticized the most by coleridge only so here uh, before we talk about the flaws we just summarize wordsworth's preface with his most noteworthy statements so here in a few points uh, i have uh, summarized i have tried to summarize the points that we have discussed so far he advocated the rustic and humble life and language as the most natural way of life as well as the most appropriate subject matter for writing poetry further he said that simple language or purified and selected language should be used in poetry and it should be written in the real language used by men further he uh, said use of meter adds beauty to poetry but it is not essential and that there is no other difference between the poetic language and prose he also rejected the use of poetic diction and figurative expression in language next he defined poet as a man speaking to men thereafter he also stated that rustic people live closer to nature and his and this impacts their language and makes it more philosophical next he defined poetry as a spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions it takes its origin from emotions recollected in tranquility so uh, this was a revision of of uh, what he discussed in his preface now coleridge in his biographia literaria criticized wordsworth's preface and on the matter of purified language which is used by common men said that rustic language is primitive so according to coleridge it was primitive and if the oddities or crudities of their language are eliminated then there would be no difference between the rustic language and the language used by people of any other walk of life then next he also said that the rustic life is minimum minimal and cannot express things logically he also criticizes wordsworth for his use of the word real language as this word real should be replaced with the word ordinary 
Coleridge also then denied Wordsworth's assertion that a special virtue lies in the language of those who are in close touch with nature. Later, Eliot also criticized Wordsworth, stating that in Tintern Abbey and uh, uh, Ode on Immortality or in the Prelude, his language is not drawn from the rustic life or the language of common men. He has used very, very different or scholarly language. And in his famous essay, Eliot's famous essay, Tradition and Individual Talent, he also rejected Wordsworth's definition of poetry, that poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. He states there that poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. So, this is how uh, uh, the writers have criticized uh, Wordsworth's preface, but the most criticized things are that Wordsworth has himself not practiced his own ideas and that his ideas on poetry are inadequate and sometimes incongruous. So despite such criticism of his theories, there are some critics who have defended his theories too. And the preface thus still sustains all the remarks and still continues to hold a respectable position in the literary criticism of English literature. His theories may have been criticized for certain ideas, but his theories definitely ushered the whole generation of writers and critics to a new world. He wanted to introduce to the world a new kind of poetry, which was not rule bound, not sophisticated or urban like that of neoclassicals or pseudo classicals and where he could accommodate and embrace nature freely. And not just in the style and content, but in language too, he wanted to make experiments. Thereby, he wanted to validate and normalize the use of the language used by common men or ordinary people in the poetic compositions and creations. So this was all about the preface to Lyrical Ballads. Thank you for watching.